can't bring us down. Not on day four of Broncos camp as teams across the league are celebrating back together Saturday. 13 consecutive hours of NFL teams hosting camp in front of fans, congregating after a year apart to celebrate the game you love with the team you love for Broncos country. That, of course, means assembling on the berm overlooking UC Health Training Center. The stampede is in the house. Broncos cheer is in the house. We've got a lot of great events planned before we get to practice. So welcome in to Broncos Training Camp, everybody. This is Broncos Training Camp Live presented by U.S. Bank. I'm Matt Boyer. Broncos country, as I just mentioned, this is back together Saturday. The NFL is, is marking the occasion by a lot of different performances by Stampede, Broncos Cheer, a special flag-raising ceremony, and an address by Von Miller. And to get us started, though, let's bring in our Master of Ceremonies, the official voice of Empower Field at Mile High, <laughs> Mr. Connor McGee. Connor, it's good to see you. You too, Matt. I feel like it's been about 17 and a half years. <laughs> but uh, we're back together again, and that's what today is all about, because uh, you, you talk about a long time. I mean, these fans have not seen camp. I mean, it's been a tradition for people to come and watch camp every single year. Didn't get to do it last year. So the Broncos are really starting this thing off with a bang today. And it's good to have everybody back. You've seen the scenes. Uh, you're, you're about to hear the sounds. The stampede is back there. The Broncos cheerleaders. And we have some great ceremonies as well. There are flag. We'll, we'll show you the ceremony a little bit later. As the, the, the hill is starting to fill up. Uh, and this is, I mean, the, the line for cars up Broncos Parkway is is extreme outside, so more people are still going to come in. But they've set up these flagpoles for the Hall of Famers for the Denver Broncos. We're going to have fans raise those flags in a ceremony in just a little bit. We'll hear from Vaughn Miller. I mean, there's a lot going on today, and we are honoring the high school champions uh, that we usually get to do at Empower Field at Mile High. That will happen uh, a little bit later after practice today. So, I mean, I guess we should probably... You want to start this thing let's, off, Let's Matt? do it. Okay. Let's do it, Connor. All right. So I'm going to hop off here. Goodbye. <laughs> See you later. And we're going to start here. Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to Back Together Saturday, where today we celebrate the return to football. Welcome to Back Together Saturday, where we celebrate the return to football. It's been a long time since we've been together here at training camp. That was August of 2019. We are thankful to be reunited in orange with all of you here today. Today, we celebrate the return to football. We're thankful to be with you, and let's get it started with a performance by the Denver Broncos Stampede and your Denver Broncos cheerleaders. Fans, give it up for the Stampede and your Denver Broncos cheerleaders. A little quiet this morning. How is everyone doing today? Everybody okay? You excited to be back at Broncos training camp? Yes? Well, today is a day to celebrate and recognize you, the fans, and all of Broncos country. 
We have a storied history that wouldn't be possible without your commitment and dedication to this team and the amazing players that have played for the Broncos over the years. At this time, we are going to recognize the greatest of those players that have been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame by raising a flag for each of them. If you're able to see, turn your attention to the southwest corner of the training facility. And we start, of course, inducted in 2004, quarterback John Elway. Raising the flag today is Keelan from Brighton. Well done, Keelan. Inducted in 2008, tackle Gary Zimmerman. Raising the flag today is Joe from Aurora. Inducted in 2010, running back Floyd Little. Raising the flag today is Nicole from Colorado Springs. <laughs> Inducted in 2011, tight end Shannon Sharp. Raising the flag today is Monster West. Inducted in 2017, running back Terrell Davis. Raising the flag today is Broncos Ken from Thornton. Inducted in 2019, quarterback Champ Bailey. Raising the flag today is Lucas from Elizabeth. Inducted in 2019, owner Pat Bolin. Raising the flag today is Laura from Aurora. Inducted in 2020, safety, he's right here, Steve Atwater. Raising the flag today is Andrew from Highlands Ranch. Inducted in 2021, safety John Lynch. Raising the flag today is Monster Carey. And inducted in 2021, quarterback Peyton Manning. Raising the flag today is Ronzo from Highlands Ranch. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for all of our flag bearers and all of the Broncos Hall of Fame inductees. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh.
as we await Von Miller's address to the crowd prior to practice, let's get to a couple of news and notes from the previous day in case you are in case you missed our show yesterday. Mike Purcell left practice earlier with what Vic Fangio described as an ankle sprain, but we will likely get confirmation on that following today's practice. Remember, Purcell's coming off that Liz Frank injury that sidelined him for much of last season, so we hope it's nothing serious there. Vic Fangio being very cautious with his guys. Fangio making the decision to hold out Tim Patrick from practice with some leg soreness yesterday. Again, nothing to be concerned according to Fangio. And then along with... They were also missing Vaughn Miller and Kareem Jackson yesterday were the Broncos. Those were scheduled rest days for both veterans. They are back out there today. Now, Broncos country, as we've been telling you all training camp long, Steve Atwater is bringing the heat when it comes to his gas. Today, we're taking a look at the offensive linemen. They're getting their moment in the spotlight, and we've got a good one to break it down for us. This guy is a Super Bowl 50 champ, a CU buff. You see him there, a Cherry Creek Bruin, Colorado football through and through. I'm talking, of course, about Mr. Tyler Columbus, welcome to Broncos Training Camp Live presented by U.S. Bank. Tyler, how you doing, man? Hey, I'm doing oh, great. It's great to be <laughs> with you guys. It's great to be with Steve, seeing all the flags raised. I love it. Oh, man, Tyler's looking so good. He was huge in that picture, man, <laughs> on the screen there. You lost a little weight, man. Uh, yeah. Well, I got on a bike, and I just uh, stopped eating. So, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Every time I see him, I'm like, but you're looking so good. What are you doing? He's like, I just stopped eating. Yeah, well, you know, when you don't force feed yourself like 10,000 calories a day, it's amazing how uh, you don't put on weight the way you used to. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, that's right. You've been out here the last couple of days, Tyler. I've seen you. What has the atmosphere been like for you at camp? You know, I've been out here every day so far, and I'm, uh, I'm glad that I got to be out here today with you guys. Uh, but it's been fantastic. Just beautiful uh, crowd, and I think the guy's been playing good football. Looks like Vaughn Miller is getting ready to address the crowd prior to practice. His ceremonial clap. Let's listen in. <laughs> Gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Super Bowl 50 MVP, number 58 linebacker Von Miller. Come on, Dad. Get it, baby. Broncos country, welcome back to Together Football Saturday, where we celebrate the return of football and our fans. Special shout out to the frontline workers here today that made it possible for us to be, to be here. And welcome to the Colorado State High School Football Champions and youth football teams in attendance today. They over there. Get them out around the round too. And we love you guys. We got a great football team. We're excited for y'all to see us today. And we can't wait for the football season to begin. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you very much, Vaughn. Guys, he brings the excitement every day, doesn't he? I mean, every day you see him, he starts with the clap. He starts with going over the berm. He recognizes the fans. How much energy does that bring to a practice? I think it brings a ton of energy uh, knowing that he's a superstar player, future Hall of Famer, uh, and, you know, a great guy in the community, Vaughn's vision, all, all the wonderful things that he's done. I, I think his voice is super loud, and uh, the crowd, they want to see Vaughn Miller. They want to see Vaughn Miller and Bradley Chubb do their thing this year. You always need a guy like that uh, in, in the early parts of training camp to kind of get everybody going, right? And not only does it get the uh, crowd going, but you need an, an energy guy for, uh, for throughout practice. You know, Kareem Jackson's one of those guys. Vaughn's one of those guys. Uh, you, you need at least three or four of those on every team. Oh, man. Yeah, some, some noise talk. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're usually on defense. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, Tyler, uh, You've been out here at practice. Uh, I know you, 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 you've been a great offensive lineman, and now you are a student of the game. What do you think, man? You, you, you think we got what it takes to get us to, to, the, to the, at least to the playoffs and possibly further? Well, I tell you what, you, you look at the roster, and at least on paper, position by position, it feels pretty good. It really does. Uh, it's always going to come down to quarterback play. That's what it comes down to every year. And based off the first three days of uh, training camp, I've been really encouraged by the quarterback play. 
Uh, the first day, I thought both guys came out and really played well. They both played efficient, and that's unusual. Day one of training camp, you know how it goes. Defense always dominates. You guys don't have to learn anything over there, right? I, I, I mean, it's so simple over well, we there. Gotta react, defense, though. Right? Uh, <laughs> we got to so, react, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, you know, the, to have quarterbacks come out and play well on day one, it's unusual, and I thought they both did a great job. Yeah. Take a look at some of the Broncos offensive linemen since we have one of the good ones here up on our stage. Bobby Massey, number 70 there. Looks like we got Dalton Reisner on the screen. Graham Glasgow, Garrett Bowles, some veteran experience. How much does that veteran experience matter, Tyler, when it comes to the names we're seeing on that screen? Well, offensive line, it's an uh, unusual group, right? Because it's uh, five guys that got to play together as one. And you look at the left side of the offensive line and you say, that thing looks pretty dang good. You got Garrett Bowles, who's had one of the most incredible turnarounds I've ever seen in, in the NFL. And, and, I, and I really do mean that. Most of the time when you talk about turnarounds, you talk about uh, a guy that off the field issues or something. That's not Garrett. Garrett just uh, didn't play the way that he was capable of his first couple of years in the NFL. And then last year, lights out. Uh, absolutely played incredible. Dalton Reisner came in his rookie year, uh, played at a very high level. Last year, uh, I, I don't know that I saw the progression that I, I necessarily was hoping for from him, but I know that he's got a long-term future. Feel great about the left side. I think both those guys can be pro bowlers. Uh, the center spot's going to be a question mark, right? Can Lloyd Cushenberry step up, play a little bit better than he did last year? And then on the right side, uh, you've got Graham Glasgow, a seasoned veteran. And I'm going to make an assumption here, in my opinion, Bobby Massey is going to win the starting right tackle job. Bobby's been around this league for a long time, and uh, I, I know that that guy can play a lot of good football. So I look at that offensive line, and I think there's no reason why they can't be a top 10 offensive line in the NFL. We saw Quinn Miners, and one of the last names on there, that list going by experience. What's his role this year? Because we saw him working a little bit at center during OTAs and minicamp. But Lloyd Cushenberry's looked good so far out here. What kind of, some of this youth and inexperience, what, what role do they have to play here as far as depth goes on this offensive line? Yeah, well, Quinn Miners is a guy that I think they're very high on. And I think that they want him to push Lloyd Cushenberry. I'm not going to say that means that they want him to replace Lloyd Cushenberry, but I think they want to push him and they want to start a little bit of a battle inside there and uh, see let the best man win. Quinn comes from a Division three school that he didn't play center uh, when he was in college. So it's going to be a tough transition for him to learn the game mentally. Physically, center is the easiest position to play on the offensive line. Mentally, it's the most difficult. you got, you yeah. got to get everybody in the right spot, and uh, you're the quarterback of that offensive line. Quinn is a guy that uh, I know guys that trained him uh, getting ready for the combine, and they say physically this guy has got the capabilities of playing 10, 11 years in the NFL uh, without a doubt. It's all going to be can he get caught up to speed mentally at the NFL level because he just uh, played at the Division three level. He just wasn't learning the game the same way that he's going to at the NFL level. So it's going to be how quickly can he get caught up to speed. But I'm very high on Quinn Miners, very high. Yeah, any guy that can push over trees uh, has a good chance of, <laughs> <laughs> of making it at this level. Right, right. Now, let, let me ask this question, TP. Uh, Lloyd Cushenberry, what do you think he needs to do? What, where does he need to make improvements in order to be able to take his game to the next level this year and keep that starting position, that starting center position? Yeah, Lloyd started out the season last year, and honestly, it wasn't good enough. He... Uh, he was giving up a lot of push in the pass protection game in particular. Yes. And you could tell that he wasn't just quite there mentally. He wasn't getting everybody on the same page as quickly as you need to. As a center, when you walk up there to the line of scrimmage, you got to be able to identify the front. you got to be able to get your call out. And then you've got five other guys that are going to be reliant on that call. And it's all going to happen. Boom, boom, boom. I thought as the season progressed, Lloyd got better and better. He's got to get a better anchor in pass protection, and he can't be so top-heavy where, uh, where he leans uh, yes, from, from the waist, that. and then guys can just kind of swim over him. So I think that he got better as the year progressed, but it, it's it's the one spot that you would say on the offensive line, in theory, is up for grabs. Yeah. Well, so you don't think that – you think that right tackle – I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the right tackle position is sold up then, huh? You think Bobby Mass has got that? Well, I, you know what? That's my opinion. Uh, I, watching day one, day two, Calvin Anderson came out there, and he was the starting right tackle. I know the Coach Fangio said that it's going to be an open rotation between those guys over there right tackle. But anytime uh, you get somebody that gets the first couple days uh, with the number ones, that means something to me, yeah. right? It, it, it doesn't it, mean It means that he knows what's going on. One, the, the coaches feel confident that he knows what's going on, and he's done something over the offseason to get the coaches' confidence. Yeah, he, he, he's the incumbent, right? So – uh, I'm not going to discount that at all. But if I'm just going off the film that I've seen, 
I watched all the film with Bobby Massey. I watched all the film with Cam Fleming, and, and I've seen everything with Calvin Anderson as well. There's no question that, Cam, that uh, Bobby Massey is the most seasoned player of them all and probably the best player of them all. Now, I will say this. Cam Fleming is a guy that when I watched his film, I wasn't necessarily super high on him. However, watching him in person, I've been really impressed by him. He's been playing left tackle. He's playing right tackle. He looks lighter than he looked in, in film, and he looks more athletic than he did on the film. So I, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see uh, uh, Fleming when he gets his crack to go with the ones at, at right tackle as well. Now, uh, a little earlier on the screen, they were showing Natani Moody. Uh, have you seen much of him this camp? Uh, you know, he came in last year. Uh, didn't play much. I think he was coming off an injury from his college season or something. Uh, but he'll have an opportunity to to press as well at, at you know at, at one of those positions in the interior offensive line. What have you seen from him? Natani was my guy, man. <laughs> I, I, I found him uh, a couple of years ago just watching YouTube highlights. No. And, and this guy was just terrorizing people at the college level. I mean, I'm talking some of the most epic college highlights you've ever seen from an offensive lineman. His problem was he ended up going two, two and a half seasons where he didn't play football in college because of injuries, and wow. nobody really knew what you were getting out of him. Last year, he came in. He had an opportunity to play just a little bit, not a lot, but he got to play a little bit, and I thought that it looked pretty dang good. Look, Graham Glasgow was getting paid a lot of money. So I'd be shocked if he's not going to be your starting right guard. But next season, next year is going to be when it gets interesting because now you've got Quinn Miners, the guy that you drafted mm -hmm. highly this year. You've got Natani, who's playing good football, who's strong as an ox. And Graham yes. Glasgow is going to hit the point in his contract where, uh, unfortunately, just the way it works with veterans, if you don't have guaranteed money uh, in your contract anymore, Oftentimes, that's a year in which teams will move on from you. So I wouldn't be shocked if Quinn and Natani were fighting for that right guard job next year. Let me ask this question. At the right tackle position, you got Bobby Massey, you got Cam Flynn, you got Calvin Anderson, and maybe even, I don't know, I don't know if Quinn Bailey's, I don't think he plays tackle, but they have those guys kind of battling for that position. Do you think one of those guys is the long-term solution? Long-term, no. I don't. Uh, I don't think you've got the long-term solution on this team right now, but uh, short-term, you've got a handful of guys that are certainly capable of playing this year. Yeah. Uh, Bob Massey is an older guy. He's been around the block for a long time. I think he started just about every game that he's uh, played in, 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 the, in the NFL, uh, starting from Arizona to Chicago, uh, and I'd be surprised if he doesn't win the starting job here in Denver as well because he's a talented dude. He is coming off injury, though, and you never know with aging veterans how, how much more football you can get out of them, right? He's a big man, too. He's a big man. That's I, right. Now, now TP, you're six there, seven. There's my guy, Chris Cooper. Yes, right. You, used, to, used to be a big man. <laughs> no, no longer a big man. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and obviously he's there uh, with the great Mike Munchak, Hall of Famer, uh, great teacher, one of the best offensive line coaches in the game. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm excited. I, I really am. I'm excited about this offensive line. Um, now, back to the center position, Lloyd Cushenberry. Can guys get stronger? And, and is, that a, is that a part of getting better, getting stronger, going from first year to second year? Of course. Without a doubt it is. And, and most of the time it's not that you're physically getting stronger, although that's possible, of course. I mean, uh, you, you've got a great strength coach in Lauren Landau here that absolutely can get him physically stronger. Most of the time, at least I can speak from my own experience, I looked stronger on the field because I knew what I was doing. And, mm, and, and when you nice. come out there in the first year or two, and mentally you walk up the line of scrimmage, you're like, is that a three down? Is that a Navajo front? Is that a pair? What's the difference? You're, you're, you're struggling to know your identifications. You're struggling to know your, your assignments. And you play slow. And when you walk out there with confidence, knowing what the defense is, knowing what your call is, knowing that you can go out there and play fast, all of a sudden you look stronger. Yeah. So I think from the center perspective, he had a lot on his plate last year mentally that if, uh, if, he, if he, the game just starts to slow down for him, he'll look stronger. I can't imagine what it would be like to be an offensive lineman, knowing that you're protecting 
probably the most valuable <laughs> position on the field, and then you not know what you're doing, and you're, you're being unsure of, like, what yeah. your responsibility is. Yeah. Have you ever been in that position where you're like, oh, man, I'm not sure who I have, or, you know, if they do a twist or something, I'm not sure who I'll take? Yeah, I mean, I mean as I got older, I, I, I tried to take a lot of pride in not being that guy. Right. You know, always knowing what I was doing. But certainly I can remember going back to my rookie year, even my second year in the NFL, and walking up to the line of scrimmage and being like, hey, I played next to Chris Cooper a lot, and I played next to Ben Hamilton a lot, and being like, hey, Ben, what do we got? What do we got? What are we doing here? What's this defense? Uh, I'm not quite sure. It's amazing how little football you know coming out of college. You think you know, right. but when you get in the NFL, you get up on that whiteboard, and they start teaching you things. You're like, man, I don't know anything. Right. We mentioned it at the top, guys. Tyler, you were a product of the, ho the Colorado high school football scene here and today at Back Together Saturday to help celebrate some of the best players in the state. We've got a ton of great high school football teams. Let's head down to Alexis Perry. Alexis, these teams are getting some pretty sweet honors today, aren't they? Yes, they are. The berm is full. The energy is high for Back Together Saturday, which actually isn't just happening here at the UCL Training Center, you guys. This is a league-wide event, which started at 8.30 Eastern and will go for 13 straight hours as all 32 teams in the NFL celebrate getting back to football and back in front of the fans. And we have a great group of fans out here today. Joining me now, we have Bobby Mestis. Bobby, we are so glad that you are here. He is the director of high school and youth football here with the Denver Broncos. And, of course, Bobby, we have the usual diehards out here. Here, but who are some of those that you invited out? We know with uh, with Back Together Saturday being so special, we thought it'd be a great opportunity for us to bring out um, a large chunk of our youth football community. So we have uh, a dozen or so teams from uh, from leagues all over the state: uh, Greeley, Loveland, Colorado Springs, Castle Rock, and of course Denver. And we also have six of our high school football state champions from this past fall and spring uh, on hand today. So a lot of fun to have the jerseys out there. So what are some of the perks of them coming to this open practice specifically? You know, for our for our high High school kids, they, a, they, uh, a lot of them are from a, a couple hours away, so uh, they don't get a chance to come to Denver all that often. So um, they're here to watch practice, which is exciting. But we're also going to take some time right after practice to uh, honor the state champions here in attendance. So we'll have uh, Dalton Reisner come over and give all those teams some uh, congratulatory words. We have a uh, state championship banner and game ball for all those teams and just try to make this day as special as possible for them. You know, I'm sure this day is also very near and dear to Coach Fangio's heart, given how much he puts into developing youth and high school football players right here in our state. How does he help with that initiative? You know, Coach has been awesome since he arrived here in Denver. You know, I think uh, once upon a time he coached high school football. So I think uh, he uh, he does have uh, some love for high school football. And, and him and his staff have been great. I mean, for, uh, for years they have assisted with our annual high school coaching clinics, which are either in person or uh, over Zoom. Um, he, he doesn't hesitate to invite high school coaches out to practice and um, and oftentimes it's him bringing ideas to us which is so exciting it's not us going to him with favors he wants to do this stuff so coach Fangio has been great to support youth and high school football here in Colorado so speaking of that what are some of the ways that you guys are hoping to grow youth and high school football you know I think uh, for our department you know that's um, as it relates to youth and high school football you know we are in line with the other 32 clubs and the NFL and that's our main mission is to grow the game and whether that's at flag or tackle or both hopefully uh, getting more girls involved in the game you know that that's our mission you know I think um, you know, we have wonderful partners in this space, not just the other NFL clubs, the NFL, the NFL Foundation, but USA Football. And, you know, we're just trying to work together to make the game as, as safe as it's ever been and, uh, you know, just celebrate the kids who are playing football. Well, you know, the high school football season is right around the corner. I'm sure you guys have some awesome things lined up for these guys. What's coming up? So uh, a couple things on the high school calendar. Um, after today is uh, Monday, August 16th, we will have our high school football media day where we will bring back um, all of our state champions, 20 teams in total there at Empower Field, just to kind of give them a, a media day experience. So they'll uh, they'll get the, to meet with the media. They'll uh, get their headshots taken. They will um, go through a, a media relations 101 course that our PR team will lead, uh, give them a tour of the building. Um, and then after that, you know, we'll, uh, we plan on hitting the road. We're going to do a, a five-game high school game of the week program where we will uh, hit the road with cheer, alumni, our Super Bowl trophies, giveaways, and uh, make a big deal of, about Friday Night Lights at uh, five different smaller communities around the, around the state. So we're excited uh, to get on the road and, and visit those communities who uh, are outside of Denver. Well, Bobby, you guys sound like a busy group. Thank you so much for taking the time today, and thank you so much for everything you do for our Denver community. Thank you. Steve, let's send it back up to you. All right, great job. Bobby Messer does great stuff in the community there community there. I love that they have the guys, the high school champs out here. Uh, TP, were you a high school champ? 
Man, it's amazing. Well, I was a high school football player in Colorado. I was never a champ. Okay. Well, neither was I. <laughs> I, uh, I. You know, I did go to a powerhouse as far as athletics. I went to Cherry Creek High School. Uh, but not during my era. We, uh, but you got the ring. Though. You got, you got, well, you got. I, I got a Super Bowl. I don't have it on me, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do have a Super Bowl ring. Uh, no, in high school, man, the closest we got was we made it to the semifinals of basketball. That was as close as wow. I got. <laughs> so let me ask you, how do you think this inspires these guys, being able to come out, watch the team, uh, you know, have Von Miller come over, address them, and congratulate them? Is that inspiration for these guys to, you know, push forward and you know we know everybody's not gonna make it to the nfl but right to at least push forward and, and give your best effort well for a lot of these guys this might be as close as they ever get to uh seeing or being on an nfl practice field but it's it's great inspiration and, and it's great inspiration for just getting to the next level i think one thing that's helped a little bit in, in regards to uh making that feel real is we've had a handful of local guys here playing on the denver broncos yes. of late. And I, I mean, obviously, I played here, but I, I, mean, I was a nobody compared to some of these other names that we've got. And Philip Lindsay, the last couple of years, and Dalton Reisner, and you know, the list goes on and on uh, of local players that we've had. Mike Purcell, absolutely, Highlands Ranch. Yes. These guys are, are local heroes that these guys grew up. I mean, their era was not that long ago, right? right. These guys, they, they, they were their heroes growing up in high school, and they can see them right there on that field. Yeah, big fan, Joe. He's had some of the high school coaches come over. He's talked to them. Man, I, I just can't even imagine, like, if I were a high school coach, being able to go and spend time with a, a NFL coach and team yeah. right in the same city, man. That, 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 that's awesome stuff, man. I, I love, love to see that. Hey, we've got, we got the cameras on the receivers out there. Trinity Benson, number 12. I'll tell you what, it's funny you bring up Trinity Benson. Uh, every day I come out here and I take notes and I try to log every single play, what's going on, and see who pops on every single play. Trinity Benson, about two out of the three days, that guy's made my notes Boy. many times. And he's a guy that the first time he caught a pass on day one, I looked down at my notes, and, and I, I, I really don't mean to say this uh, sounding like a jerk at all, but I was kind of like, man, he's still around. Right, you right, know? right. Like, no, he like, has. Like, he's like, hung like, around, yeah. And, and, but, but then I was like, you know what? Keep your eye on this guy because when guys like Trinity Benson are still around and they're not necessarily household names, but there's a reason why the coaches want to continue to see him year in and year out. The turnover in the NFL is so big and so fast that when you see a guy like that stick around year after year and continue to make plays, just keep your eye on him. Hey, he's got a tough road in front of him. He's got yeah. a lot of great players in front of him. But there's a reason why he's still here. No, I agree. And when – Football teams are constructed. It's it's kind of crazy because you have some guys who will kind of be at the top. Who all right, they're, Bob Miller, he's not going anywhere. Bradley Chubb, Cortland Sutton, you know, Dalton Reisner, Drew Locke, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. They're they're good. Yeah. But at, on the other end of the spectrum, there are some guys who hey, it can be it can go either way. Either <laughs> any day they can wake up and and have that pink slip. Uh, so those guys are the guys who can really make a difference on your team, uh, whether it be special teams or, or coming in working hard, earning a spot like Tim Patrick. He's coming to hard route. Ross Smith went that route, uh, coming in as a free agent, working hard, working hard, you know, putting in the work, and then the coaches noticing that hard work and, uh, and uh, just rewarding them with uh, a spot on the team. And you just yeah. never know. The sky is the limit. Yep. You know, this is the first year that I've looked at this roster and felt like, you know what? I don't see too many holes. I, I got a handful of positions that I could look at and say that's probably a concern. Okay. But but you look at, at at the roster as a whole, especially as the starters. Man, defensively, you got the highest paid defense in the NFL. You got it. You got a coach that is supposed to be a godfather of of defensive uh, play calling. I mean, no reason why this defense should not be a top unit in the NFL. Offensively, you go down the list, and you like just about every starter. Now, it's come to quarterbacks can come down to how do these two guys play, who yeah. wins the job. But what feels different this year to me, Steve, is depth. And, and, and our special I teams agree. has been so bad for so many years. Mm. There's no hiding it. It's just been bad. Yeah. But the reason why it's been bad is – 
your depth has not been there. Yep. I think this year's draft, uh, uh, in a lot of people's opinion, George Payton uh, uh, should have taken Justin Fields or he should have taken a quarterback, whatever. Well, he went after a bunch of depth players this year. Uh, Pat Sertan's not a depth player, but the yeah. rest of the draft, you look <laughs> at it and you say they might not be starters, but they're quality depth players. And I think you're going to notice a difference in special teams this year because the depth of your roster, the back end, those are your special teams players, and they're better than they used to be. I, I agree 100%. Uh, and I'm sure you can look back to the years where you guys were winning, where you know you went to the Super Bowl. You guys had guys who could start. Yeah who were on the bench, or I don't say on the bench, but they, they weren't starters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Think about, like, David Bruton, guys like that. they yes. just special team stars. Yeah. As we mentioned at the top, guys, this is back together Saturday. The fans are getting a, a great view of all of that talent we've just been referencing. And it doesn't take newcomers long to figure out that Broncos country is the real deal. They're committed to their fan base. And one of those newcomers is, of course, Broncos general manager George Payton. Phil Milani caught up with the Broncos GM to get his thoughts on training camp and seeing Broncos country in person, in mass, for the first time. George, it's back together Saturday celebrating the return of football. Got the fans up there on the berm. How much energy do they bring to practice out here? They bring energy, you know, to the players, to me, you know, to, to the coaches, to everyone. You feel it, you know, with my office kind of, you can see the fans show up in the morning and it's just, it's fun to go out there. It's fun to hear them, fun to listen. It's, it's, it's great. Vaughn gets them pretty pumped up, huh? I know he talked to him uh, before practice today. Yeah, Vaughn, all the players, you know, get them pumped up when they score a touchdown. Judy yesterday. So it's, it's fun just to see the fans. Obviously, we missed them last year. You know, this year is going to be fun, especially in the fall, you know, out in, in Power Field. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, today is day four of training camp. Uh, how have the first three days gone? Going really good. Players are working really hard. Um, you know, the offense and defense and special teams. So like what I'm seeing, uh, it's been clean, it's been crisp, and again, the guys are working hard and making progress. Obviously a lot of attention on the quarterback competition. Uh, what have you seen from those two, and what do you still need to see? Yeah, just more consistency, but both guys are competing. They're both, you know, having their ups and downs, but for the most part playing really well and getting better every day, and that's what it's all about. Any of the young guys catch your attention? You know, I think all the rookies are playing well. You know, they're all kind of what we thought, and, and uh, they're playing well. And, you know, not, not one specific player, but I like the group as a whole. Well, maybe we'll see some touchdowns, get the fans going today. Huh? We will, definitely. Thank you. All right, George, thank you very much. Back to you guys. Thank you very much, Phil. Yeah, guys, following John Elway as a general manager in any organization <laughs> is going to be a tough task. But George Payton seems to have passed that test with flying colors. Tyler, in your mind, when you look at the roster, how has George Payton imprinted his style on what we're seeing on the football field? Yeah, it looks like he's going after a lot of quality depth players, and he's looking for the slow build. Hey, man, uh, I think it's fair to say uh, George Payton will be evaluated in his first draft off of how does Justin Fields play in the decision to pass on Justin Fields. We've got a 50-50 quarterback battle going on right now, and we've got Teddy Bridgewater, and we've got Drew Locke, two guys that so far look like they're playing capable football. But when in, in two years' time, uh, everybody's going to look at Justin Fields and say he was on the board, and you had the opportunity to select him. You didn't do it. You went after Pat Sertan, and that's going to be a huge part of the story. So when I look at George Payton's identity, I look at a guy that is truly going to take the best player available, and, and that's what he did in his opinion. He went after the guys with the highest grades, and, and I think that that's a slow build. That's not necessarily something that's going to result in winning 12, 13 games this year. Uh, but if you give him the full six years on his contract that he's got, which I'm sure he's going to get, uh, over time you should have a very competitive football team. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Tyler, uh, that he's going the, I would say the, I would say the safe, it's kind of the safe route, but also the, the route that's more sustainable. Um, and I would imagine they felt like Justin Fields, there was a risk to take him now, but I, <laughs> Whenever you take a quarterback that early, it's kind of a risk. But yeah, sometimes you got to shoot. You got to shoot the shot, though. You know, listen. If I was uh, if I was sitting in his seat, which uh, I'm sure many people are glad I'm not, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I would have selected Justin Fields. I, 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 there's one thing to trade up to go get a quarterback and give up the farm to go get him. It's an entirely different deal when he falls to you and you're just sitting there on the board. You know you got a quarterback issue that wasn't quite good enough last year. You've acknowledged that by opening it up to a 50-50 battle. 
Uh, that's not a secret. Uh, everybody knows it. You've got two guys that are fighting it out this year. I guess what it really said more than anything else is that he didn't think that Justin Fields was better than Teddy Bridgewater or Drew Locke. And if he did, he probably would have selected him because he's acknowledged that he needs to get better at quarterback by opening up this battle. Yeah. And I got to be honest, like, I didn't take a deep, deep look at the quarterbacks to see, all right, what were his strengths, what were his weaknesses on a, on a, on a you know, Look at game after game after game, and those guys, they, they've had to do that. They've had to look at, you know, the scouts, they had to look at all the film, and, uh, you know, they, they came to that conclusion. So, hey, I, I assume that they know uh, more about the situation than I do, uh, but like you said, time will tell. I think it comes down to it's as simple as this. A lot of people talk about philosophy with draft, who you should draft, where. I think that the best GMs are the best evaluators. And, and it's not about a philosophy. It's not about selecting a position in the first round or addressing a specific need. It's about what GM can evaluate the talent every single year at the highest level. Yeah. And, if, and if George Payton evaluated Justin Fields at a level that he didn't think was better than the guys he's got, well, that's his decision, and, the, and that in, in a couple of years, we will evaluate it, yeah. we'll look at it, we'll see was he right or was he wrong. Uh, but it's not about the philosophy of the quarterbacks, it's just the evaluation. Yeah. And Mike Chulo on the screen there, he's the guy responsible for making those guys better once you bring them in, the quarterbacks, that is. Yep. Uh, and uh, and he's, got, he's got Teddy Bridgewater, he's got Drew Locke, and he's got Brett, R Brett Rippon. Um, Brett Rippon really isn't in the picture. Should, should he be in the conversation as a starter, or you think we just need to keep it between Drew Locke and uh, – I think we're sharing enough the, reps between Teddy Bridgewater yeah, yeah. and Drew Locke for uh, the, the actual starters conversation. But, hey, I, I was talking about uh, Brett Rippon on my show yesterday, and uh, I'm glad he's in the building. Uh, I like Brett Rippon a lot. And, and with the opportunities that he's been given – it feels like he finds a way to pop every single day out in practice, and he only gets a third of the reps that these other guys are getting. Uh, but he looks good. I think he's a great developmental uh, practice squad type of quarterback. Uh, I don't want him taking any more reps away from Teddy or Drew. <laughs> right, right. We need uh, all of them. Uh, that, that, those guys need all the reps they can get. But I'm very glad that he's in the building, and I think he's a great developmental guy. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if they're able to keep three quarterbacks or, or just two, and like, what will be the – the deciding factor in that yeah i uh i've been on teams that have kept three not many uh most teams keep two on your active roster and then you put one on the practice squad uh so what we'll see i think brett Rippon would really have to prove a lot to make the 53-man roster uh but and, and maybe maybe it's as simple as this sometimes a guy plays so well that you don't necessarily want to carry him on the 53 but you don't think you can get him to the practice squad because right. when you cut him uh, any team can can go claim him and, and, and then you can't get him to the practice squad so sometimes a guy will just play football that's so good that you say well now we have to carry him on the 53 because if we cut him try to take him to the practice squad someone that's else gonna is going to pick him. him up yeah we saw pat Shermer there chatting it up with uh, george payton uh, what do you think they're talking about out here at practice now? What, 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 are they talking about going out to dinner or are they talking about, hey, man, quarterback's looking good? <laughs> uh, uh, I think they're talking about consistency. That, that's what they're talking about this, with those two quarterbacks in particular. You know, day one, I thought both of the quarterbacks looked great. If, uh, you know, on, on our show, we're, we're, we're picking a winner every single day because that's that's just what we're yes, doing. We do, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, if, if anybody said that Drew Locke won day one, I would totally understand it. If anybody said that Teddy Bridgewater won day one, I would totally understand it. I think that truly was a coin flip. They both played really well in day one. Day two was a landslide. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater won that thing and ran away with it. Uh, but day three, man, did Drew Locke bounce back yesterday, and he needs to start stringing together days like that yeah. where he plays really good football like he did yesterday. Whether it's Drew Locke or Teddy Bridgewater, that offensive line is going to be leaned upon heavily to protect either one of those guys. And that offensive line, as we mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of continuity there hopefully means a lot of success, and a big reason for that continuity and success will be, I'm talking about offensive line coach Mike Munchak, the Hall of Famer, is, uh, is down on the field right now monitoring his offensive line. Phil Milani had a chance to catch up with Mike Munchak earlier in this week to find out more about this talented group and find out how many offensive linemen we might see make that final cut.
Micah, after all these years, it's the start of another training camp. You still get the jitters. You get excited about it. It is. It is exciting because uh, obviously everyone uh, high expectations, like we all have. Every every team the league has right now. I feel like we had a nice, good off season. Added some nice, you know, some good competition. So we got a great group. I think I have 15 guys out here, and uh, this is a great start. It's great having the fan base out here again. That's going to bring a lot of excitement to it also. It adds a lot more energy to their practice. So uh, lo looking forward to this uh, training camp. Yeah, it feels a little bit different this year. Uh, what do you want to see from your guys out here over the next couple of weeks? Just uh, consistency. Uh, we're going to move guys around quite a bit. You know, we're trying to find the best group of guys. You know, we have 15, like I said, maybe 10 to 12 guys could make it, be here, be part of the be part of the team. So just want to see some great competition the next 10 days and then obviously get a chance to see us compete against Minnesota and then the preseason games, which would be very, very helpful for us as a group and for the young guys. And guys got to, you know, guys got to step up and you know, we hopefully it'll become very obvious who the best group is. You got a position battle right there, a right tackle. Uh, how do you think that's going to play out? Um, I, I'll be, it'll be fun to watch. I think uh, the guys get an opportunity to do that, uh, uh, playing right tackle. Even, even some of the guys may be playing left, but I, you'll get a chance to see who the best two or three guys are. Uh, like I said, I think that usually becomes obvious as, as the more training camp goes on and you get through the two days and you get through the, the preseason game. So uh, that'll be fun to watch. And also for the, the, the depth, and uh, it's good that we have pretty much competition every position this year. So I think it's be fun to watch. And the last one for you here, Coach. Uh, Garrett Bowles, obviously a great year last year. Where can his game even grow and improve this time around? Uh, like most of us, uh, it's, it's starting all over again. He needs to pick up where he left off with all the good things he was doing and then improve in areas where he knows he can even be even better. He could be a very dominant player. He, you know, he's very gifted in a lot of areas with the size and the strength he has. He can pretty much do anything. He, we, he, we pulled him quite a bit last year. He did well there. So he just needs to pick up where he left off. Notice he's starting all over again, and uh, he wants to just build off last year. Maybe another all-pro season. Mike, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate thank it. You. Thanks. Steve, back to you. All right, great interview. Man, Garrett Bowles, look at those stats. Last year, 1,015 snaps, seven penalties. Well, in your position, Coach has nine Pro Bowls, two All-Pros, and a gold jacket. And you listen to him, that's what you see, wow. right? Look at the improvement from right. 2018 Huge. to 2020. Tyler, you've been around a lot of offensive line coaches. Why is Munchak special? Is it yeah. that gold jacket pedigree? Well, he's. Uh, I think there is something to be said about being a player coach. Uh, I've had a lot of coaches that were great that were not players. Uh, but there is something different about a guy that's played the position that knows what he's doing. And, and the turnaround that Garrett Bowles had last year, Honestly, it was one that I, I don't know how just about anybody could call it. Uh, obviously, people in the building uh, stayed loyal to Garrett, and they stayed, uh, they, they kept their belief in him. Uh, but that was one of the most incredible turnarounds I've ever seen in, in, in the NFL. I mean, I've seen guys turn it around, but most of the time it takes a new stop. It takes going to a new city and, and just getting rid of all the bad blood, the bad taste uh, of everything that's happened elsewhere. What Garrett did last year was just flat out incredible. You could see it in his body. He looks stronger. He looks more physical. Uh, I, I, I just hope that uh, he keeps his head to the ground and uh, uh, stays humble and keeps working hard because this game has got a way to, uh, man, it, it catches up to you quickly. So I uh, just hope he keeps working hard, and I'm sure he will. Yeah, so in what areas of the game, when you looked at the film and compared what he did last year to previous years, what things did he do differently to be able to make those improvements? Yeah, it, well, technique, you start with technique and pass protection and uh, if you think about it as a pitcher, uh, Garrett Bowles had one pitch uh, every single time in, in his pass protection. He went to the exact same set over and over and over. And many times that involved one kick, maybe two. He'd open up his hips. He'd give a two-way go to the uh, pass rusher. And then they could go outside. They could go inside. They could bull rush him. As an offensive tackle, you want to set with your shoulders squared to, uh, parallel to the line of scrimmage. After two or three kicks, your shoulders should be parallel to that line of scrimmage. So you're not giving him that two-way go number one he fixed the technique number two he found a change up he started using an up kick he started uh, uh, jumping on the guys at the line of scrimmage uh, and, and really as an offensive tackle you should have three or four different pitches that you go to so, He's now, starting to do that how many of those pitches are there available out there in the atmosphere I mean is it like maybe just four five six of them or yeah yeah I, I mean there, there's probably only about four of them that even exist okay right? and and so it's all about the timing and the place of when you use them 
most of the time the play call will tell you when and where you can use said pitch. So you know if you get if you get a play play action pass, a uh, great time to up kick. Matter of fact, you have to up kick. If you get a three step pass, it's a great time to cut a guy, dive at his legs, try to take him out, uh, just mess up his tempo, make him think you're going to dive at his legs every now and then. If you get a seven step drop. You probably don't want to up kick, right? You, you're you're going to have to set deep because your quarterback's going So you don't deep. have no idea what an up kick is. Or, yeah, well, an up kick. No, 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 that's good. That's good. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, when I say an up kick, it's, uh, it's like a play action pass. So instead of taking two steps backwards, I'm going at you. Okay. And I'm going to try to get on you right away. Uh, rather than giving you the space to, uh, to charge at me two or three yards, I'm going at you first. That's why I had to stop reading offensive linemen for pad, run that's pass right. keys. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you did okay. What I, whatever you were reading, you were reading it all right, buddy. <laughs> oh man, that's cool though. I, I always w- wondered that, like, how, like in your arsenal, how many things does an offensive, especially a tackle, need yeah. to have? Yeah. You know, I, I probably, I probably had four. So. I had my normal set, my angle set, right? I had my deep set, which was a vertical set, where I would just set straight deep on a line. Mm-hmm. I had my up kick, and then I had something that uh, my coach Rick Dennison uh, here in Denver uh, taught me called the Harry Swain. You remember Harry Swain? Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, Harry had this set where he would, he would take two kicks, act like he's going on a vertical kick, and then he would jump the guy. Ooh. So, so you, you bait the guy into thinking he's got time, uh, you're, you got three or four steps before I'm going to get on you, and then you jump them, right? Right, right. Uh, that was my favorite set, and it was funny because I'd go to other teams and I'd play at other places, and I'd use that set, and I had, my coaches would get mad at me. They hated it. Really? And, Why? Well, because it's just not a typical set. It's not a typical technique, and there's a lot that can go wrong. And, and when you jump a guy like that, if you don't get your hands on him, you gave him the short corner, yeah. and, and he can go get that. He'd get the quarterback. But, I, I, look, I was never the strongest dude out there. I played with my athleticism. And I would just tell my coaches, look, <laughs> if, if, you, if you want me to be able to stop a bull rush, you've got to let me do this two or three times a game because I'm going to be able to throw the guy off of his tempo. Right. Because the guy knows you can only do a couple of things. <laughs> they could can bring, bring the kitchen sink at you. But if they know that you got some change up. It's all about the spot of the collision. So a pass rusher. They time everything based off where they think they're going to collide with you. So if they think you're taking a vertical set, they know that they're going to collide with you on your on their fourth step. So that's when Vaughn might hit that quick spin. That's by way when he might hit you with the with the arm crossover, the judo chop, whatever it might be. But if you can get him out of that spot and surprise him, and you hit him on the second kick rather than the fourth, that's when you mess with them. I mean, I love to see a uh, an event where you were teaching and von miller were teaching the other side uh man that would, that would be some battles <laughs> and i guess in, well, in, in the end if if you have two guys an offensive guy who has different uh different sets different uh ways to yeah. handle the, the 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 rusher and then the rusher who has different things in his toolbox yeah then that comes down to the then it would come down to athletics uh, athleticism yeah you know, if you watch uh, one-on-ones between an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman, uh, a defensive lineman probably should win seven out of ten reps. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's set up for success for the D-line. So if, if, if I won a handful of snaps for practice, I felt pretty good about right. that because we're setting backwards. They know it's a pass. They they get to they, they just get to do everything on their terms. Yeah. We're, we're reacting to them rather than being the dictator. But that's what makes it so great when you change up your set and you change up the, what, what pitch you're throwing. Now you get to be the dictator, yeah. and they got to react to you. Oh, man. That makes it fun. That's, it's, it's all a game uh, at every position. Uh, I know as a, as a safety, for me, I was playing games with the quarterback with my alignment. Uh, you know, they want me to line up and show that we're either in you know, some type of three-deep coverage or cover, cover one. Uh, but we line up in cover two every time just – Make everything look like cover two. Whether yeah. it's cover one, yeah. cover four, whatever. It all looks like cover two. And then we, even when we had cover one, we try to take a couple of steps. Like, I'll take a couple of steps like I'm going to the half before I go to the middle of the field. Yeah. 
And I'd have mother safety do that before he dropped down. So uh, well, you're not just messing with the quarterback when you do that. You're messing with the offensive line too, because uh, you know it, it took me until about my maybe second, third year in the NFL before I started looking at the safeties. No uh, but, way. But when I when I came up to the line of scrimmage, I had a progression. Uh, I would identify the front. I would call out my my call with uh, my guard that was right next to me. We got to be. We got to scoop. Whatever it is. Uh, and then I would eye the safeties, especially if it was in uh, pass protection. Wow. And, and, and if I saw those safeties start to rotate, and if I saw one go to the middle of the field, and I saw one start to stack over the corner, I knew, hey, I got field pressure coming. You right? know what's funny? When we, <laughs> when we do sometimes when we're playing cover three, we, we would do that. Yeah. We, we, I'm sorry. If we were playing cover two, we, we would move up and down yep. like we're playing yep. cover three, and then we'll come out of it and go to cover two. Right. But so it would mess with us, too, because if you if you rotated the middle, the other guy walks up, and he, and he starts to cover up the corner now i'm thinking i got field pressure but then you bail out of it out of the last second uh and and i think i'm going to be blocking a corner blitz in reality i'm still blocking my defensive end because you guys bailed out of it out of the last second wow so you didn't even know you're messing with us i know right <laughs> i know uh yeah, drew lock in there now yeah, the, the, who's that who threw the ball 283 there looks like andrew beck andrew beck he's back beck is back I like Andrew Beck's you know, game. You know who's been popping at tight end the last couple of days is uh, uh, Eric Sauber. Did has. I say that right? Yeah, Sauber. Sauber. Uh, yeah. I, I don't even know much about his story, but I keep looking down at my notes, and I see that 82 keeps making my notes. Plays, and, yeah. uh, he's, uh, he looks like a good little player out there. Yep. Fifth year out of Drake. 6'5". I didn't know that Drake had a football team. <laughs> right. This is the basketball, right? <laughs> Oh, man. So during these periods, uh, individual, well, we got uh, seven on seven over here. What do you guys normally, what are the offensive linemen normally doing back there? Uh, well, they're not well, going against defensive linemen right now. Yeah, right. I mean, right now it looks like they're taking a water break. I mean, we got this country club uh, training camp going on. <laughs> we, got, we, we got two half times in the middle. Of, I mean, we go 20 minutes into practice, and all of a sudden these guys get a 15-minute halftime. I'm like, what the heck is going on? They go another 20 minutes, they get a second halftime. Have you ever seen anything like this, Steve? No, I haven't, huh? man. I, I wish I, I wish. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, it's blowing my mind. What so is NFL going on here? should have been fighting for us huh? like that, huh? Yeah, no, but normally, <laughs> see, what's going on right now is they're not in pads but normally when a team goes to seven on seven that's when the offensive line defensive line goes to one-on-ones so uh in a couple days when they've got full pads on uh during seven on seven you'll be watching the o-line d-line going on one on one yeah. uh, today is a little bit different because they don't have their pads on so they're getting like a little extra individual period in it doesn't look like they're doing a whole lot of anything right now though <laughs> just, maybe just some teaching going yeah. on uh yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. Mike Munchak's over there telling the guys where they need to go. I mean, they're just talking about how to get dirty, you know, how, 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 how to just be the blue-collar workers of the team, you know. Now, on many teams, the quarterback is the leader. Would you would you agree with that? The quarterback is, the, you know, kind of the, the mouthpiece and uh, the guy who – most of the players look to at yeah. least you know, Tom Brady. You got, you know, when we played John Elway, Peyton Manning. Is Drew Locke that person, or would Teddy Bridgewater be that person on this team, or is there someone else who you think the team views as a leader? I think the quarterback has to be the leader. He doesn't have a choice. Uh, I've been on a couple teams in situations that were similar to this where we didn't necessarily know who our quarterback was going to be when the season began, and it was always weird because you would have other guys try to step up and become the full-time leader of the team. But, Steve, uh, it, it, as good as you were, and, and, and you're a stinking Hall of Famer, I'm going to be out there next weekend watching <laughs> you get your gold jacket. Uh, John Elway was still John Elway, right? And, Absolutely. And, 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 and it was he, no, there's no question back right, 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 right. But, but, <laughs> but I, mean, I mean, part of that was just that he was the quarterback. So the quarterback has to be the leader of the football team. Yeah, I think I agree with you on that. It's been great being able to see some of our local media brethren here at training camp after a year apart. And it looks like Alexis Perry has found herself a Broncos insider down there. Huh, Alexis? Yes, I sure have. It is nine, excuse me, Denver 7 Broncos insider Troy Rank. Troy, thank you so much for being here. We're so glad to have you. You know, day four out here, great crowd. But what are your biggest takeaways from on the field so far? Well, certainly the crowd. I mean, there might be 3,000 out here, Alexis. But on the field, quarterbacks continuing the momentum we saw yesterday. 
we do believe the defense will be the strength of this team, but I've been encouraged early, even today, with the burst of Melvin Gordon and the accuracy of the quarterbacks. That was an issue last season. So far, some encouraging signs from both quarterbacks. You know, Coach Fangio said post-practice yesterday that he's not seeing a lot of separation between Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater. Are you surprised by how tight this quarterback battle is so far? Well, I'm not really, because they both do different things. If it was a jigsaw puzzle, puzzle and you could put them both together, it would be the perfect quarterback because Teddy is steady. Drew's a little dangerous, but they do both things well. What I saw yesterday was that Drew took the checkdowns, and he finally is kind of realizing that sometimes you just got to move the chains. Teddy is accurate, and looks like someone catching a touchdown now, Cortland Sutton. <laughs> but Teddy is really accurate, Alexis, and that's what's going to be his strength. I just wonder if it'll be a philosophical decision because I don't know that either guy can secretariat and run away from the other. So we'll come down to the veteran of Teddy and more experience or the upside of Drew and his potential. Yeah, that was a Drew Locke to Cortland Sutton touchdown there. Speaking of Cortland Sutton, tons of weapons for these guys to choose from. Who seems to be the favorite for each guy so far? Well, Jerry Judy and Teddy Bridgewater clearly have a connection so far. I've said this, Jerry Judy is better than space than NASA. I mean, you cannot cover this guy. K.J. Hamler early on is a problem in the slot because he's so shifty. Cortland Sutton is going to be a weapon for either quarterback because of his ability to be open when he's covered. And they have more weapons and you throw Noah Fan in there, you see the potential to be explosive. Now it has to play out on the field, but Teddy has a good connection with Judy. Obviously we know Drew Locke knows Cortland Sutton well and I think he will lean on him if you know Cortland's healthy early. Expect him to lean on Cortland Sutton. Well, on the defensive side of the ball, I know you guys just did a feature on Caden Stearns for Meet the Picks. What have we learned about Caden Stearns so far as he's joined the Denver Broncos? Well, he's crazy athletic. I think if he had played one more year in college, he might have been a second or third rounder. He is that good. He almost has, what, 42-inch vertical leap. At Texas, he was all Big 12 as a freshman. Then he dealt with some injuries. He opted out uh, late in the season with COVID-19, but he loves football. He grew up playing his state championship game, 42,000. He didn't have to watch Friday Night Lights. He lived it. And he loves football. That's what he, I said. Why are you playing football? He's like, I'm from Texas. It got end of story. But he's got a chance here because he's so athletic. They don't need a starter with Kareem Jackson and Justin Simmons, but they need depth. So Caden Stearns, because of his athleticism and his willingness to tackle, which we know Coach Fangio loves, gives him a real chance to make an impact in the margins, maybe in a sub, you know, sub package or even on special teams. And he learned from Michael Huff, the former uh, Texas star safety there. So he's been grooming himself to be an NFL player for years. Well, the Denver Broncos and Broncos Broadcast Productions are so proud to partner with Denver 7 for a new show coming up called Broncos Country Connected. This will air every Tuesday at 6.30 on Denver 7. Troy, tell us a little bit more about the program. Yeah, this will give us a chance to not only partner with you and all your guys' great talent, but, you know, seven, eight minutes of content from us. We can provide a unique perspective. I will be at all the games, kind of take you behind the scenes, take you where you can't go, tell you what you don't know. Nick Rothschild will be involved with unbelievable Unbelievable features. Nick thinks a little out of the box. So I think we'll complement your coverage well with some of the X's and O's. Uh, we'll be talking with, you know, former players and also uh, give you a feature. Maybe you didn't, you know, find something out about a player you didn't know. So I can't wait. Again, as you said, every Tuesday night on Denver 7 at 630 take you behind the scenes and it will be plenty of great content from you guys as well. Yes, we are so excited to be doing this with you guys. Of course, take you inside the UCL Training Center and the Denver Broncos Football Club and give you guys a really unique perspective. Troy, thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. Looking forward to the partnership and uh, have a great day out here. Back to football. We're back. Alexis, it, it feels great. It feels so good to be back. You know, in addition to our partnership with Denver 7, of course, we also have some great partnerships also with our good friends over at Nine News as well. As we take a look at some of their programs, Programming that they have coming up this year as well. Of course, you guys, the Broncos preseason schedule. Take a look at those games starting August 1st. 14th, excuse me, the Broncos will take on the Vikings in Minnesota. One of my favorite shows, Broncos Huddle, is back with Rod Mackey and Dalton Reisner. Wednesdays at 6.30. You guys will not want to miss it. I'm also thrilled to announce a new show coming to Channel 2 thanks to the Broncos partnership of Fox 31 and its sister station. Orange and Blue Fridays will be the Broncos lifestyle show full of food, fitness, fashion and of course football. That airs live Friday morning starting on September 10th at 9 a.m. And for the night owls out there, be sure to tune in to Broncos zone every Thursday at 11 p.m. Steve, back over to you. All right, Alexis, great interview with my man Troy Rank. Come on, man. 
better in space than NASA. Uh, Troy, said about <laughs> I mean, Troy, uh, Troy's I like got that. one of those just about every single time I talk to him. I don't know where those things come from. I like that one. Though. That was a good one. <laughs> Troy, Troy's hair is coming along, too, isn't it? Yeah, Troy's hair. He's got some good hair coming along. Some yeah. flow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Solid flow. All right. It hasn't been like that? No, it's been like that for a while. But, you know, he's uh, staying committed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we saw um, Austin Ford on a reception there, and uh, he was injured a couple of years ago. Uh, I believe it was, was was it the Hall of Fame game? Yeah. I believe he got injured in. Got injured in uh, was on the roster last year, uh, and, hey, the team stuck with him, man. And, and I, I thought he was going to make the team that year when he got injured. Uh, so... Man, it's going to be interesting to see how he develops and if he'll be able to play a part at the tight end position, although we're, we're quite deep at that position. Yeah, we're probably full, to be honest with you. Uh, it, it's going to be tough for all those guys on the back end of the roster to make the team at the tight end room. You, you've got Noah Fant. You've got Albert O. Uh, you've got Andrew Beck. Those are kind of your three incumbents. Am I missing anyone in there? I don't think so. Uh, but th but those are those are your main roster guys. It's going to be tough to carry more than three, so you're going to have to replace somebody in the, in that grouping if you're going to make the team. Yeah. So you said no fan, Abado, and who else did you say? Uh, Andrew Beck. Oh, that's I right. Not, see, he's, he's kind of he's a kind hybrid, of a hybrid though. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah the right. fullback, uh, well, H-back, tight end. They're not carrying a true fullback in this Different. offense, so uh, I, I guess you could classify him as either one of them. Right. Uh, I think it's a tight end by trade that, that happens to fill in at fullback. <laughs> and I'm probably thinking, too, with Albert O, them easing him back in, that uh, as he gets healthier, if he's ready to go, if he's 100, 100% by uh, week one, although he's out here on the field now, if he's you know back to where he was last year, uh, I imagine that, uh, you know, we'll just go with those three. And you could see the uh, chemistry that Drew Locke had with Albert Okwebenon last year. I mean, that was uh, pretty amazing. The second that Albert got out there on the field, Drew Locke was locked in on his oh, old teammate, and, and they were having some fun together. Like we're doing it like we did back, back they in were. college. They sure were. <laughs> I don't know if Pat was like, hey, man, throw me the ball, too. Does anybody have more fun during a practice than kickers? No. I, I mean, seriously. No. Uh, look, look at these guys. Brandon's one of my better friends in life, McManus. But, I mean, goodness gracious. <laughs> what is all this guy does all day long is just have fun. He's, he's goofing around with people. He's catching interceptions. He's yelling at the crowd. He's he's throwing darts. I mean, they, they practically got sandbags out there. What do these guys do? Yeah, I, I saw on social media somebody said he missed – Eight kicks or six kicks in practice. He's like, no, no, I missed one. <laughs> Put on your glasses. <laughs> Get them right, Bre uh, Brandon McManus. Yeah, go That's see right. an ophthalmologist. Right. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I might know the person that said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kickers are certainly uh, – have a, a little bit easier, but they got to put their work in too. And, and I, I would say for kickers, uh, punters, it's a big time mental game, you know. Make sure you put the work in and then be mentally ready because you could be called on at any moment to to make a play that's going to win the game for you. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. It is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's get some love love, love to the long open buyer. That's a uh, Northern Colorado Bear right there. Yeah, that's yes, right. Sir. Jacob Boban Moyer. Is that uh, how you said Boban Moyer? Uh, I said, uh, yeah, sure, I'll go with the Hall of Famer. Yeah, I'll trust you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, UNC. Northern hey. Colorado. Yep, yep. Beautiful place. All the Colorado is beautiful, though. Yeah. The, Deion Sizer. There we go. Punt returners. Deontay Spencer. Looks like K.J. Hamler's back there. Will there be competition at that position as well? Well, I would imagine it's Deontay Spencer's role. If Deontay Spencer makes the team, it's going to be because he's your, your specialist, right? He's going to be your kickoff returner, be your punt returner. I think there's going to be a time and place for K.J. Hamler. Uh, more than likely, 90, 95% of the time, though, you're looking at Deontay Spencer. And, and Hamler might just be a fill-in in, in case something else is going wrong. Uh, Deontay Spencer's been a good little player for the Broncos the last couple of years. He hasn't, he's only had one or two wow plays, 
uh, but if you look at his his average return, he does a good job. It's it's, it's quiet, it's sneaky, but uh, it does a quite good job for the Broncos. Let me ask this question: If KJ Hamler had been healthy last year, do you think? You know, we it was a possibility there could be more competition at that position. Well, if I was running a football team, I wouldn't carry a specialist like Deontay Spencer. And it's not that against Deontay Spencer at all. Uh, it, it, like, t take him out of the equation. Uh, just talk about the actual position itself. I would not carry a kick returner and a punt returner because I don't think that that's a, it, that's a valuable spot on a 53-man roster. Okay. When you've got a guy like K.J. Hamler, a lot of people would say, well, you drafted K.J. Hamler too high to put him back there and put him in jeopardy. And I would say ah. you, you drafted a guy high because he's electric, because he's got that that's type right. of speed. And, and if I got that type of speed, I want him back there returning kicks. So, you know, if I was running a team, I wouldn't carry a Deontay Spencer role, not the player, just the position. Right, absolutely. And uh, I, I absolutely would want K.J. Hamler back there returning kicks. Yeah. And I, I think hopefully he can stay healthy this year and we can see more of him. Man, he's electrifying when, when, he's, when he's healthy and available. But as we know, hey, the, the best ab ability is what? Availability. That's availability. right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, we're showing the offensive lineman over there, the big dogs. I mean, like, this is kind of embarrassing right now. I'm trying to talk about the big dogs like they're always down there doing some hard work or something. I just I don't know what's going on in these practices anymore, Steve. We got half the team taking a knee right now. This is this is break time this right is, now. Yeah, This it break is. Time. Yeah. Yeah, we gotta have I mean, some they, break they time. They got a clock up there and everything. How long do these breaks <laughs> go? You got another three, three and a half minutes. Huh? Tyler hasn't been out of the league that long, and he's already acting like back in my day, it used to be like this. I, I can tell you this much. I never got half times in the middle of training camp, <laughs> yet, yet alone two of them. <laughs> you, you know what? That's actually not true. When I was in Atlanta, we did get we did get halftime, but it was 100, 110 degrees and 400 percent humidity. Steve's lived down there; he knows what it's oh, like. Oh yeah, you know that uh, that's a Super different Super humidity. Animal. We we got those as uh, necessity health breaks. You know? Right, right, right. So Tyler, how much has the game changed from when you played to when you retire from the game? Oh, you know, I don't think all too much. There's little nuances that are starting to evolve. I would love it as an offensive lineman. Look, I, I, I think the Garrett Bowles uh, deserves every ounce of credit that he got for his turnaround last year. But he also benefited that, that it happened to coincide in a year in which the league decided to stop Steph calling holding, holding penalties, penalties yeah. right? And, and that was uh, ab absolutely one of Garrett's biggest struggles. Now, uh, I'll defend Garrett here a little bit before I, I go in on it because Garrett's biggest problems were in pass protection. And, and he would wrap his arms around a guy's neck and he would WWE take, him, take down him uh, to the ground. That would have gotten called last year just as much as it would have two years ago. And Garrett, so he stopped that, right. and Garrett fixed that. Right. But a huge part of his success is that he didn't have the holding penalties called. So when you ask the stuff that has changed as an offensive lineman, that would be my favorite thing. So you're telling me in the running game I can get my claws up in on you and, and, and I can actually hold on to you and you're not going to call it? I mean, I held on every play I ever played That's, in my entire th career. Thank you, Tyler. But, Most offensive linemen don't agree. Don't, don't admit well, that. Well, it's only holding if you get caught. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. There's holding every single play but, by but, an offensive but now, lineman. But now they don't even have to worry about getting caught. Right. <laughs> they're, they're not calling it. Yeah. Oh, man, that's funny. Now there's holding within the confines of the rules, Steve, and then there's then there's the holding that's going to get called. Right? Yeah, some of them just if, obvious. If, if you get your hands on the breastplate right there on the numbers and and you latch on, that's what you would always go for and, and try to latch onto the pads right there. No way that's getting called. I, if you get your hands on the outside, you put it on his shoulder pads. That's getting called every time. My favorite, you know, what my target was I used to go for. I used to try to get the V of the neck, so 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 right 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 where the uh, the shoulder pads would come down, and there's a huge space underneath that. Right. So so I would aim for the V of the neck. I would clamp down, and I'd have my hands on the inside of his shoulder pads. There's no getting off that once I got my hands on there, and it's not getting called because your hands are inside. But why would you guys do that to the safeties like me when I try to blitz, man? <laughs> bro, I used to hate that. I, I get I get I get caught up. I'm like, bro, I can't I can't do anything. I'm just stuck. Yeah, well, you know, most, nowadays most DBs when they see uh see not safeties because safeties got to actually make the tackle, but corners when when they see a tackle out in space, they try to tack they try to cut the tackles now. Oh. So so they dive at the tackles legs and and try to just take the tackle out of the way. Safeties, at least you guys had to at least attempt to make a tackle. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. That's funny stuff. 
At the back end, look at the pro bowler, Justin Simmons. Great to have him back. Yes, great to have him back. Uh, and they were talking about Caden Stearns a little bit earlier. Uh, I do like, oh, man, nice reception by Mr. Jerry Judy. Guys, we've been talking about back together Saturday all day long, and it doesn't conclude when Broncos practice ends. NFL Network will have coverage all day long from the beginning of today all the way through tonight. And speaking of NFL Network, let's head back to Alexis Perry, who's standing by with one of our NFL Network favorites. Alexis, that looks like James Palmer, but I don't see a beach. I don't see a body of water. I don't see a palm tree yeah. where he's not living up to his Jimmy Palm Trees nickname right now. Yeah, Jimmy Palm Trees in the Mile High City. Uh, I will say the only thing he probably has going for him right now is the fact that it's like 100% humidity out here in the Mile High City. So you probably feel like you're right at home, huh, James? I do. I just came here from Jacksonville, Alexis, so this does feel nothing like that. I don't think it might be the only time I wear long sleeves, though, throughout all of training camp, so I'm pretty stoked about that. I think today might be my most perfect day of training camp because after this I head to Vegas in Houston. I've heard it's warm in both those places. I've heard it's a little toasty, but hey, if you were in Jacksonville, obviously covering Trevor Lawrence, not much of a quarterback battle going on there, but we have a pretty good one going on here in Denver. What's the national perspective of this Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater quarterback battle? The national perspective is this. This is a really, really good roster, a playoff caliber roster, and the more teams I've talked to, they're like, if they have a franchise quarterback, and we don't know if either one of these guys can be that, this is a not just a playoff team, but a Super Bowl contending roster. And that's why I think the decision in this process is going to be so important in who they pick because it is a different vibe around here than it's been in years past. I talked to a bunch of coaches and players after practice when I watched it yesterday, and it was like, we're kind of tired of losing. Look at our roster. I mean, I had some executives tell me, like, if you eliminate the quarterback position, which is a weird thing to do in football, right? It's only the most important position in all of sports. The Broncos have a better roster than the Chiefs, top to bottom. And it sounds crazy when you hear it, but then when you look at it position group by position group, you're like, that's, that's not really crazy type of assessment. So I think it's what you need for this roster, and I think they're trying to figure that out. They'd like it to happen sooner than later, but everybody I've talked to is like, they might hope they have four preseason games, which they don't, because it might take that long. You know, I've asked everybody who's come on this show, the way too early edge, who are you giving it to? I can't give one because I literally was told by somebody off the record after practice yesterday, there is no front runner. There is nobody in the lead right now. It is way too early. They'd hope by the time the scrimmages against Minnesota happen, somebody's starting to separate themselves a little bit. But right now, they're not even doing a daily evaluation like all of us in the media are, right? The team isn't actually even doing that. So there's not really a front runner. The curious part about this is you have a general manager who has six years on his contract. You have a head coach who has two losing seasons and needs to win now. I don't want to say they're differing philosophies, but both guys are in different situations for how they look at the quarterback position, too, which makes it more complicated. Obviously, there's some other storylines going on around this team. What's one of your favorites that you're covering out here? Nobody will shut up about Jerry Judy. Like, and, and it's real. Yesterday, he was on fire. The confidence is high. I talked to a couple of defensive coaches that were like, I've never seen him this confident. And you saw him pumping up the crowd yesterday after a couple of catches. He, the way he plays the position, and Xavier Howard, who had – 10 interceptions last year. He'd like to be traded right now, but he had 10 picks last year for the Dolphins. He said he was put in a blender by Jerry Judy on a slant, which is a pretty easy route. So it shows you how good of a route runner Jerry Judy is, and I think that plays all those skill guys into this quarterback battle. You may not have to push the ball downfield with them because what they can do after the catch, too. So you can look at it. Both these guys play it differently. The skill guys are what makes it interesting. Is there a particular position group that you are really looking forward to seeing? D-line. I think D-line, for sure. I think Draymond Jones is is a, is, is a guy i got to watch this year. And then we get Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller together. You, know, you have to go on TV. I have to go on TV. <laughs> he has to go on TV. TV. Sorry, guys. Thank you, James Palmer. We really appreciate it. Steve, back up to you. All right. Thanks, AP. James Palm Tree Palmer. Jimmy Palm Trees. Yes. <laughs> great interview. Great. <laughs> Guys, as we wrap things up here on day four uh, from Broncos training camp, back together Saturday, I want to get a final thought from each of you. Tyler, go first. What, uh, what have you seen out here with the atmosphere with, you know, back together Saturday, but also some of the things we've seen on the field? Well, it's one of the uh, best atmospheres we've had so far of training camp. This is fantastic. I love seeing all the kids out here, uh, all the state champions and, and kids that are dreaming of being out there on that field. 
love the atmosphere. It looks to me uh, like uh, we're having a pretty good practice out there, too. I think both quarterbacks are doing a lot of good things. I saw Drew Locke have a couple big moments in 7-on-7. Seven 7-on-7 seven. Seven seven doesn't matter as much, but uh, he had a big moment. And then I saw Teddy Bridgewater just have a big route to uh, Jerry Judy there in the last team period. So based off what we could see from up here, it looks pretty good. Steve, you want to give a final thought here on day four? Boy, it was great to get a flag uh, risen uh, and for all the Hall of Famers. That's, that's a great honor. And, uh, yeah, the, the team is looking good. They, they, they really are. Um, I think Drew Locke and Teddy Bridgewater are both coming along nicely. I saw some nice passes from Teddy Bridgewater. He over overthrew Jerry Judy on one pass. Uh, Drew Locke, he completed some good pass passes. I'm scramble out to the left. Uh, outside the pocket where we don't like him scrambling left because he's got to throw with the right hand, uh, but he was able to do that and complete a pass. Uh, so I think we're coming along nicely. Uh, um, it'll be interesting to see when they start to uh, diverge and somebody starts taking the lead at that quarterback position. Today it was a flag. A week from today, Steve, it's going to be a bronze bust in Canton, Ohio. So we're looking forward to that. Tyler, real quick. I want, to I want to thank you for being here. I know you've been out here every single day, but to take some time out of what you're doing, charting, we really appreciate it. Where can folks find you on social media and the radio? Well, I'm doing the Daily Show Monday through Friday, uh, one, uh, excuse me, on 104.3 The Fan from 3 to 7 p.m. So do that with uh, DMAC, and you can find that Monday through Friday. I'm on Twitter at Tyler underscore Columbus. Uh, other than that, I'll be out here watching practice. Look for the tall dude. <laughs> hey, man, did D-Mac talk you into losing weight, man? He, he's looking good, too, man. I talked D-Mac into losing weight. You? What you talking about? Oh, no, there we man. go. No, D-Mac's actually, he's, he looks amazing yeah, nowadays. Well, yeah, he's he's great, really man. doing well. Broncos country, we are off tomorrow, but then on Monday, we will have three, starting Monday through Wednesday, we are going to have three straight shows from Broncos training camp, and we kick it all off with the man himself. Look at that guy. Carl Mecklenburg is going to be at UC Health Training Center. We're going to be breaking down those linebackers. He and Steve will share some stories, I'm sure. That all starts at 9.30 a.m. on Monday. But until then, Broncos country, for Alexis Perry and the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater, I'm Matt Boyer. So long. We will see you on Monday morning for Broncos Training Camp Live, presented by U.S. Bank. Oh, awesome, man.